This episode of Human Factors Cast is brought to you by Audible.com. Go to audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast for your free 30-day trial and pick from thousands of books uh, from a lot of different genres. Get a free book every month. You know, if you're not listening to Human Factors on your commute, you can listen to an audio book. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't like that book, they'll switch it out for you. Audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast is a great way to listen to books. There's a ton of psychological benefits with it. Just go check it out. Stop listening to the podcast. Go do it, and then come back and finish the podcast, because today we're talking about ergonomics. So let, let's, should we start? I think we should start. Yeah. Let's get it. All right. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts. Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined by Mr. Billy Hall. Hey, guys. How's it going? I'm back again. Mr. Blake Arnstor. What's up, everybody? How you doing? Uh, I'm good. How are you? I'm doing actually really well. I'm kind of excited today. I'm, I'm excited, too. We got a lot to talk about. Right, right, right. Um, but, but before we begin, I just... Oh. Yeah, there's is the principal coming out of his office? Does he have some administration things to talk about? I have uh, some administration things for the podcast to talk Ooh. about. Uh-oh. This I, is where we hire you and fire me, right, Blake? Oh, uh, it's not bad. Oh, God, it so, just got awkward. So, yeah, you're not in trouble. <laughs> uh, you're not in the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> We're going in a different direction. <laughs> you are not in trouble. No. Uh, so so regarding our upcoming shows, right, um, I just I just want to like let the audience know what, uh-huh. we're, what we're talking about over the next couple episodes. That way, if they have any questions, they can send them in. We've received a lot of great feedback from our fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're really glad that you guys are enjoying the show and listening. Um, but uh, a couple of the shows we have coming up, um, next episode we'll be talking about human factors of space exploration. Going back to that, uh, that that back to how nine thousand. Yeah, that panel that I was at yeah. at uh, oh, okay. human yeah, factors. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time we're all back in the studio since. Oh yeah, it is, isn't it? it it's is. been a minute. It's really right? exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so we'll be talking about human factors of space exploration, and then for Halloween, uh, this will come out on the twenty seventh of this month. Will be the psychology of fear. You mean the psychology of clowns? The psychology of fear. Clowns. Uh, not not exclusively clowns. They all float. I mean, they all float down here. They all float. So, so yeah, we'll be covering the psychology of fear. Um, and then after that, we'll get our impressions on the PlayStation VR, because that's coming out in like like a week. It's already a week? Really? Yeah, a week from now? It's a week. I mean, what up? October 13th. It's a week from now. Is it true that most places have sold out of it already? Uh, yeah. I got really lucky with my pre-order. Um, oh, Wow. So we'll get impressions of that. Then we'll go into video game design the following week at uh, the recommendation of one of our listeners. Oh, okay. Um, you know, and, and again, if you guys have any questions, send them in. Beyond that, we're going to be talking about usability testing methodology. So like methods, metrics, and more, a bunch of different stuff. Psychology of Thanksgiving will come towards the end of next month because our show is going to be airing on Thanksgiving. We're not going to do it on Thanksgiving, but, uh, you know. I mean, we could always do it on Thanksgiving. I could avoid actually eating my I body weight in turkey. I'll be I out of town. Skype in for that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then uh, we're going to be talking about the human factors of theme parks. So, like the rides, experience, attractions, shows, all that God, fun it's stuff. Been forever. I think we should probably go to a theme park before then. What do you think, Blake? I think you might be right. Yeah. I think I just went to one this weekend or three this weekend. You went so to three this weekend. I did. You juggernaut. Let's, let's yeah. Okay, let's wait okay, for. Okay. 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 And okay. then the psychology of color. We got a lot of fun stuff coming up. So if you mm-hmm. have any recommendations, please send them in. Um, if you have any questions about this topics, send them into our social media, um, our human factors cast at gmail dot com, and we'll address them on the show. Also. Uh, another piece of administration is uh, we're hoping to start live streaming here on uh, YouTube. Ooh. So, so stay tuned uh, to our social media channels. So, um, you know, Facebook, SoundCloud, all that stuff. Uh, on for more news on when to expect that to happen, um, and uh, when we do get it up and running, those will happen every Monday. Mm-hmm. at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. That's Pacific Standard Time. Um, but uh, the audio epi- the audio only episodes will still drop every Thursday for you guys uh, on your favorite RSS feeds. So uh, we're hoping to live stream, really, so you guys can see how the secret sauce is made. And our studio is just rad. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, question about that. Are we going to be doing the whole show on YouTube? 
the whole show. Oh no! Everybody gets to see all the goodies, <laughs> and uh, it may and, not be safe for work. Oh, I know. No, no, no. It'll still be safe for work. Of course, it will be. Uh, and this last piece of news, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to announce that uh, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf will be a permanent fixture on the show. Um, so welcome officially on board, Blake. I know you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, but yeah, but I appreciate here. it, guys. I'm stoked to be on the podcast for real now. Well, we're really happy to have you. I mean, Nick is only uh, what four people short from having your own coven. Yeah, six, Some, something like that. Yeah, something like that. So All right, scrolling. magic. So now that the administration stuff is over. That took a while, um, but it was important to get out there so that way people know what's up. What are we talking Absolutely. about today, Billy? We're going to be talking about ergonomics. Ergonomics. Here we go with some crazy stuff. So other than like Ikea furniture, I do not know what I ergonomics actually is. Is Ikea furniture ergonomics? Well, they oh, always when say you're putting ergonomics. It together, yeah. No way. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. It's just uh, a bunch of hieroglyphics then. Uh, the design of those those uh, manuals, I like, I'm in a love-hate relationship with them. Sometimes they're awesome, but sometimes they are horrible. Oh, God. All right. So so ergonomics. Let's talk about ergonomics. Yeah. So er- what are ergonomics to you, Nick? Like, what's it really encapsulate? Uh, Something that fits to the human. That's like the basic level, right? So, so in the notes, I have uh, safe, comfortable, efficient, right? And as long as it meets those criteria and, and sort of molds to the human being, Mm-hmm. Right. And in, in the physical sense. Right. Because we talk about human factors and that that to me is almost like the ergonomics of the mind. Right. How can you fit the mind to a task or a piece of software or How whatever? To make it intuitive, really. Right. But but the ergonomics side of things is um, the physical side. Yeah, it's really cool because it brings like, OK, your mind is expecting something. But how does your like how do your hands or even your feet like interact with the product to make it work? Right. As a meet a middle model that okay, way. Okay, I kind of get this idea. It's kind of like in uh, the movie The Avengers, that joke that uh, Robert Downey Jr. character makes. He, uh, Nick Fury, he's uh, in- Iron Man. Iron Man, yeah. Iron Man makes, he's uh, right there on the helicarrier, and can he puts I, his hand over his eye. Billy, can I have your nerd card? Because that was- It's been pulled. I was trying to- Oh, God, really? <laughs> anyway, um, he has a like an eye patch on, and he's like, how does he see the other half of these screens? And he's like, he turns. That's kind of like the idea of ergonomics, would be designing it for a one-eyed man. It could be. That's actually a really That's... cool example. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, we need, okay. to, we need to do an accessibility episode. <laughs> 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 But yeah, that's kind of how it works, right? So, okay. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a good example. Now, the one thing, though, I, I know, but just like that idea, there's a, a ton of people of all different shapes, sizes, different types of strengths. Uh are they all taken into account when many making a project project ergonomic? Mostly. Yeah, usually. I, I mean, you incorporate and look at different types of data, right? So we're looking at how what shape and what size people are, what's a typical and what's like an extreme outlier. You're looking at really what's called anthro- anthropometric data. Nailed it. So this anthropomorphic data. What, <laughs> anthro- anthropometric. Anthropometric. Can you think of metrics? What was I saying? Anthropomorphic. anthropomorphic. What does that mean? Uh, it's it, not real. Yeah, it's like when you when you attribute a um, anthropomorphism is when you attribute a human trait to a uh, non-human entity. So, like, oh, the happy little toaster. Uh, yeah, yeah, or 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 like the one I like to use is is uh, f- humans thinking that their animals have feelings and, other than the basic primal needs of I need food. And oh, I get you. Like, get oh, you. he's happy. Well, Giving yeah, he's... you a personality and stuff yeah, like exactly, that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. That's okay. anthro... And we're talking about... Anthropometrics. And anthropometrics is... Like the measurements of the physical body. Okay, 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 okay. I get it now. I get it. Get right, it. And, and so that, that makes sense when you're talking about it in the sense of, of uh, ergonomics, right? Because you're trying to match the physical body to the product that you are designing. Yeah, you're using things like how long people's reach is, how tall people are for getting in and out of cockpits and things like that, for example, or even the weight distribution that people have to have. Have you guys ever been re, uh, reseated on a plane to distribute the weight? No. They actually do that? Yeah. What? So oh, listen like, to this guy. The skinny guy <laughs> doesn't know about redistribution of weight. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm being slighted here. <laughs> A little bit. So 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 yeah, this um 
Yeah, and you basically use these data, this, these data to um, to develop these products. All right. Uh, so you get this data. Uh, where did enough data come from in order to provide these standards of size, shape, etc.? Is the NSA constantly measuring the size of people through the Google Skynet? Are we in the middle of another conspiracy? So Snowden, Edward Snowden, I uh, knew it. Yeah, he he gives us all the data. He put it in the Rubik's Just cube. Just personally, yeah, he he put it in the Rubik's cube. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that new movie. No, no. So a lot of oh, my parents said it was really good. Yeah, they I dug gotta it. See that. Yeah, no. Uh, so a lot of this data though comes from the military, right? They uh, this is where they get a lot of information. Um, and they, they basically measure all their soldiers when they come in all their, you know, and, and so and if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Cause you're having a, just an influx of people constantly coming in. So it gives you that really good population size to make these like inferences based right. on but, population. But everybody who's ever, who everyone I've ever met who's active military has always, you know, been fit and. You know, lean muscles and things like that. That's an excellent point, Billy, and I'm really glad you brought that up because that's exactly the problem, is that most of the sample comes from a non-representative population. Yeah, us tar- tubby lardos. No, not us tubby lardos. Well, not even the median. Like, you're getting some of these more, like, higher end. So, like, your 95th percentile, these guys that are tall and fit and really strong, like, it's just not representative of all the people that are either in America or anywhere, really. Okay, I get it. Um, so this data though, so this data though, it comes from like military people, but you don't really have it from any other sources though. Right. Uh, but I mean, it still can be useful, right? I mean, you can, you at least get an idea, right? Of, of what people could be. Yeah, because you get like a nice wide distribution still. Because if you think about it, you still have like some people that aren't, the war fighters, right? You got people that sit behind desks, so that's a little bit of a different build sometimes. And then also you mm-hmm. have women of different uh, like sizes and shapes too. So it gives you some kind of idea, like okay, this is what I'm typically seeing. What can I? How can I use these kind of proportions to design products? And that's a really important, of course, in the military, right? Because now you've got people whose lives depend on some of the machines they use or some of the technology they're getting into, right? Okay, so they're basically taking in, like, you know, height, weight, movement, standard, mobility, things like that. And so you have all this information, but, I mean, I can see how some of it might be useful, but how is it all useful, though? So now you're, what you really do is you just think you have to design products specifically for people. So a good example is height. So if you think about, again, going back to just the distribution of people – you have this like 5%. So, this so is- really quick, Blake, I'm going to interrupt because uh, some of our m- listeners might not know what a normal distribution looks like. Um, and if you if you were to break this down, it looks like, are, are you familiar with a normal distribution, Billy? What, like the medium of people's tight abilities? Yeah, but are you familiar with the shape that it takes? Like, How do you mean? Like, uh, if you were to graph it, are you familiar with what the dis- a normal distribution looks like? Oh, I didn't even think about it, really. What do you mean? So, so a normal distribution is where you have um, you have the average, right? And, right. And that's that's the zero point, like right in the middle. Right, right, right. And you have the majority of your population right at the average. Uh huh. And as you go out from the middle, uh-huh. uh huh. And I, I wish we were videoing the podcast now so I could show you, but uh, as you go out from the middle, um, the population of that fits that criteria mm-hmm. uh, decreases, and so so it's kind of like a bell curve type of thing. You got it. That's exactly what it is. That's what okay. I was trying to Okay, because I got the idea of the distribution as, like, you know, what is the average versus what is the high end and low end of a human capacity. Right, right, right. So so the majority of the time, they are, um, and when I say they, I say designers are designing with 95, give or take, percent. I mean, it depends on, on what the application is, right? It depends. That's the motto of the show. It depends. Exactly, yeah. But, I mean... You know, they could they could be designing something that uh, somebody needs. You know, the population is towards the upper percent or the uh, the ninety fifth percentile or something, and so they could be di- design around those requirements, or they could design for a wide range of people, which they would have to, you know, examine. And this bell curve, 
can be applied for everything on the body. So like hands have a certain distribution. One person can have a distribution where you have really tiny hands. Uh huh. And you, another person. Okay, this is not political. This is not political. And another person could have really large hands. And this is not a political show. I am not even going there. Okay, so so you have large and small hands, mm -hmm. but that same person could have tiny arms or large arms. And so now you have to design for all these things. So what they do is they take the average and they kind of design around that and say, okay, this is what we're using. Okay, so basically you take the general average, like uh, kind of like uh, the middle part, the, the, the medium of it all, all that information, and then you kind of, Collate the data or match it up with arm length to high length and make kind of like generalizations. You got it. Oh, okay. Okay. So you do that. And then where do you take it from there? Well, let's, okay. So let's think about height. Uh huh. Right. So here's an example, right? So you use height uh, in the top 5%, or, or I guess the 5%, right, would be either the tallest or the shortest individuals, right? And then because this is the five percent is going to be the lower end, right? Right. The five percent could be the lower end, or it could be the the higher end, right? So let's say you wanted to design a product that you want to accommodate, I don't know, shorter people, right? Like let's say you need let's say you need infantrymen that are short, um, or, or or sorry, let's say you need pilots that are short to fit in this cockpit, right? So you would design um, to sort of you know go for that five percent, right? Because okay. then you would like constrain the space or make it smaller based on like how big the population of like aviators are i guess would probably be the way to go right okay i see the same idea is with people with like uh in horse racing they actually specially design certain saddles because they want people who are lighter and shorter so they take the average of uh let's say a derby jockey and actually take the average of that right yeah that makes perfect sense yeah you got it's like design okay. a product based off the people you want all right so i mean you're designing products off of the people you want and like there's different types of things like height and you have to match it up with different aspects. But what are some of the things that you have to take into account when designing a workspace, though? How does this work for computers and cell phones and things like that? Right. So so this would be taking into account like like their body size um, or I mean, like, let's say it's a very labor intensive job. You'd want to take into account things like strength, too, uh, you know, so. Also, with strength, you want to maybe take into account uh, how dexterous the individual is, like uh -huh. how quickly they can move, and also, you know, what what kind of skills are required for that, and are they physically able to do that? And also, too, something important to think about is the space you're actually designing within, because if it's a really big space, you have a little bit of more leeway of what you can put in there, how much machinery you can fit, or if it's like a cubicle set up with a bunch of desks, then you have a little less space to deal with, so that's important to think about, too. Okay, so like, um, I think we brought this. I, I'm I'm pretty sure we brought this on up on a show once, Nick. Um, the idea of like, uh, uh, Iron Man's like little digital screen board, or all those sci-fi shows where they have a giant like laser board that you can pick up things or open boxes and things like that. Like the Minority Report board. interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me that it was one of those things that it's not really practical because we're expecting people to move their arms and grab things right, yeah. all day to make a hundred little movements. Blake, were you there for that show? No, but yeah. that'll make somebody really strong if you make them do right. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like they're they're using their hands all day long and, and doing it. And so like you have to take into account that's going to fatigue the user very quickly. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. You know what might be interesting for that would be eye tracking in that instance, right? Like if you're moving your eyes from side to side or focusing on one place. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, uh, how narrow would that focus be? How does that eye tracking happen? Also, wouldn't it have to take in consideration in ergonomics, like space, so space of the eye, shape of the eye, and things like that? It would. That's exactly what it would have to take into account. Okay, okay. Kind of like, uh, but I mean, like... Uh... Like uh, what? So, like, a <laughs> so cell phone, right? What's next on the right? show notes, Billy? No, I know what's next on the show notes. I <laughs> Sorry, I threw a wrench in the smokes. No, no, no. I, I get, no don't even give me that. No. <laughs> I had actually a legitimate thing. If we're always taking in consideration things like that, why are phones getting wider and wider and bigger and bigger? It doesn't fit in a normal-sized person's hands, no, you know, normally. It's getting to the point that they're becoming the size of tablets. Do you have tiny hands? Are you a? Are you in the tiny hand camp? 
<laughs> this huge, is not a political show. I have not a huge show. hands. They're huge. Uh, no, that's actually an interesting that is, point. Yeah. yeah, that's something I didn't even think about. Um, and I mean, like, think about your average user. Like, uh, for me, I was really stunned when tablets came onto the scene because I was like, who's going to use that? And because it won't fit in a pocket, it won't fit in an average pocket. So, like, I don't know, the male demographic is out, but you can still put it in a purse or something or a backpack. So I guess maybe the male demographic isn't out if they have a backpack on them. So that leaves students, right? So so these are kind of things that I was like, how is a tablet going to work? And then you get the use case where the tablet is predominantly used in the home as a an entertainment device. Right. Laying in bed, watching. Which really, who saw that coming? Because that's an amazing feat right there. It really is. They took a leap of faith on that one, I'm telling you. Wow, that's really interesting because if they thought about that, think about it, though. When tablets and, and laptops started coming out, the idea of it is is that, you like you said, women can keep them in purses, people have more, bigger bags, students have backpacks, but not everybody wants to carry around a backpack all the time. Right. So then what happened was is that satchels came back into fashion real big. I mean, is that kind of an ergonomic trend? Is there trends in ergonomic? Like one person says, this is big because this was designed this way, so let's make something that goes along with it? I mean, I feel like that's just a consequence of what people make, right? Because you, mm-hmm. you, like, you make a f- specific phone like this one with your case on it that's got like the little button on there. I mean, it's specific to it. But, it. but going back to what you said about why phones are getting bigger, I think I've like thought about it for just a second. I mean, if you remember those old school Nokia's. It only takes him a second. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> He's so but like smart. the old school Nokia's when you were texting when that started getting big, you're like jamming your two thumbs together like with a really small amount of space. And oh, as you yeah, get yeah, like yeah. these yeah. bigger phones, you're having more space and it's more designed towards using two thumbs. I remember so those little stickers ergonomics. that went at the end of your thumb that would actually make a little bit more of an indentation so you could push the keys more accurately. I remember those things. I didn't have any. Of course I didn't have any. Huge thumbs, though. Uh, okay. Big hands. So <laughs> what happens if something is designed without taking ergonomics and human characteristics in mind? What's the big deal? Uh, the product fails. How so? I mean, a lot of people make products every day. <laughs> so, I mean, the product can fail, but, I mean, the, the biggest one that I've, like, come into and we learned about it in school is you can actually hurt people with bad, badly designed products. So, like, you know how you use your keyboard and the big thing is... Uh, Carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel, there we go. Well, you have to have all these add-ons to make sure your arms are staying straight and your wrists don't bend too much. Like, things like that can add up over time and people don't notice it and it'll kind of put you out of commission. Oh, kind of like how laptop stands have become in a big deal because of the fact that people are leaning over to their keyboard and getting back problems. Oh, yeah, they're <sighs> turning to the... Can we talk about video game controllers and carpal tunnel? It's gotten better. Really? Oh, it has over the years. I feel like it has. I don't know anybody. Uh, maybe it's just because I don't play that many video games, honestly, but I've never heard of that. Is that people getting carpal tunnel from video games? Oh, oh for sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. What planet do you live on? <laughs> no, really. Never even thought about it. Really? No, yeah. So so uh, it's really interesting. I read an article on, on the uh, placement of uh, sort of the, um, what do you call those? The joysticks? Yeah. The, the directional joysticks uh and, the and thumbsticks the thumbsticks yeah so like the 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 placement on like an xbox one controller versus the playstation controller um and their effects on carpal tunnel and uh you know in in the xbox one it's uh and 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 sort of the demographic that it goes with like the xbox one controller is uh like designed for a western demographic because y- you know think about it it's a little bit bigger yeah um and and uh, you know the thumb placement is up higher. And if you think about it, if you think about using the Xbox One controller, you can almost keep. One of the big factors in carpal tunnel is um, is sort of the uh, the straightness of your wrist, right? And so if you think about it, <clears throat> you know the Xbox One controller, your wrist is straight. If like like think about you actually sitting down and you rest your right arm on your leg, and you rest your left hand on your other leg you can almost hold the controller at an angle um but and that will keep both of your wrists straight but if you play the playstation if you use the playstation controller like pretend like you're holding the playstation controller all right how are your wrists situated my wrists are situated kind of bent in a little kind of angled in right 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 now if if uh, and and like I said, this one was typically designed, or not typically, but it it took into account more of an Eastern audience. Okay. And and so you know, Eastern 
typically a little bit smaller in frame and stature. And so maybe in Eastern uh, demographics, you know, the, the, the wrists won't be bent as much. Right. It's a really interesting paper. I got to find it because we could do a whole episode on like, that is really cool. Yeah. So, on, uh, I mean, is it because of the fact that they have to take in a larger demographic? Like they have to take in kids, teenagers, adults, even the elderly have been getting in on the games. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, just think about, like, the Super Nintendo controller. That thing hurt to play. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was no extended play with those things. Uh, yeah. Oh, remember I mean, the, I mean, the weird callus you would get on the N64 controller on the C-pad? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, somebody posted on Facebook the other day, the N64 is the best controller ever. And I was like, mm, uh, no. From what? what? What human has three hands? Talk about designing for... <laughs> yeah, that, that was such a weird design. <laughs> yeah, did anybody actually play it lefty? Like, it was like they put it there so that I mean, people could play righty or lefty. But did anyone ever play le- that controller lefty? I mean, it was just it was just a poor design. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, yeah, yeah. It was really bad. Ah, we got to do an episode on video game controllers. Oh, so cool. dude, it would be interesting to compare it to like the Atari, the first controller to come out for a home console. Just watch games. the evolution, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like how was it? I mean, it didn't seem that bad. Rubber grip, nice, fit in the hand real well. Who knows? Right. What's next? All right. So my notes say to ask you guys about occupational biomechanics. What the hell is that? Are we talking about cyborgs? Please tell me we're talking. That's a about good question. Cyborgs. That's a great question. I have no idea what occupational biomechanics. <laughs> Yeah, what's no. that? Uh, <laughs> if you don't know, that can't be good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just because I, I I know what it is, but I mean, we have to like do a yeah, big yeah. disclaimer on this episode is that like Blake and I are not experts in this field. We, well, You guys are, here's the thing. Ev- like I've told everyone before, Blake and Nick are both accredited scientists of human facting practitioners, and by no means are human they- Human facting. Human uh, facting. We, human we facting give the practitioners. Facts. But this is, like we said, this is barely even a syllabus. This is the scrap of paper you found. We're giving you the tools to look into it on your own and make your own decisions on a growing job field, right? Most definitely, yeah. I mean, at a high level, we can tell you like what it is, maybe. But that's us actually looking up definitions at t- it sometimes. So. Well, I mean, you're not masters at everything. That's given truth, right? 100%. Yes. I don't, I don't think there is a master of anything. Well, Ever. Yeah. Except Kung Fu. You have yeah. to have a long white beard, though. No, Bruce Lee didn't have any beard. Yeah, he did not have a beard. Oh, Blake has a valid point. that one there. No. Yeah. I what wonder if he would have developed one if he had gotten older. Probably. All right, so Back to it. biomechanics. So this is this cyborgs. Is basic, okay, yeah, cyborgs. Uh, this is yes. cyborgs. This is basically using physics right, and engineering in how the body um, – or how, how, how physics – and engineering affect the body. Yeah, because now it's taking what we were talking about in ergonomics, right? The measurements, the height, and how you put it into action, along with coupling it with how your body like uses energy and things like that. Right, and like how, how like the angles of your joints and like all that, all that stuff. It's it's crazy how much how much goes into it. There's like a NIOSH lifting equation that dictates how much you can lift in a given hour without the human getting fatigued. There's uh and, and you know it, that equation takes into account like what angle your arms are at when you lift this thing, what angle your legs are at when you lift this thing, how heavy is the thing, what kind of shape is the thing, is it a box, is it a sphere, is it something, is it a triangle, how how much does it weigh, um, how well can I fight crime with my rocket launcher? You fight crime with a rocket launcher? Cyborg, man. Cyborgs. Okay. Duh. I got it. I got it. I got it. I mean, like, I, I joke, but I mean, this is probably something they do take in consideration when they're making things like prosthetics and things like that, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is a great example. Think of like a jackhammer. Okay. Think I'm... about what that does to the human body. Like, it right. is it is shaking them. Shaking you violently. Right. Your arms. like, And so, so they have to take breaks. Um, but... But more importantly, is that is that, you know, safe for the human to do? Um, and one of my favorite examples is like when you when you think about using a screwdriver. Yeah. Think about using a screwdriver. OK. If you are or, or sorry, think about using a, a, a pistol grip drill. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. You're using a pistol grip drill and you are going to um, drill something in to uh like a like perpendicular to the ground okay so so you're drilling something straight into the ground right how do you want to drill that like how is your body positioned is your arm straight 
Are you pushing your weight down on top of it? Well, my shoulder is raised and my elbow's up in the air. And then I'm drilling down like this. Is your arm with my bent? Chest. Yeah. Is it straight? Because I'm drilling straight down into the ground, right? Right. The optimal um, design for that would be to straighten out your arm. That way you get the most force behind it and there's no weak points in your arm. Yeah, but wouldn't you also have to consider accuracy? I mean, drilling is really great, but, you know, you still got to be able to put it in straight because you can put a screw in and crook it. Right. Yeah, and that, that gives you the most accuracy, too, when you straighten out your arm and get right above it. Because that's that really weird. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of using making the tool an extension of the human body, right? Because now if you're holding it straight and your wrist is straight, it's almost like that drill is just another piece of you. Right, and now think about think about drilling something into the wall. Okay, right? yeah. Now imagine it's slightly above your head. How are you going to hold your drill? It's gonna be, Your arm is going to be raised at an angle. It's not going to be straight to the pistol grip. Right. It's going to be angled. Right, so if you can get a step stool or something to step onto it to make your arm right in line with the pistol grip, you're going to have a lot more accuracy, a lot more force behind it because your arm is straight. There's no way that it's going to bend on you while you're pushing it in. It's things like this that you have to take into account. Like, So if there was a um, a designer of sort of a, an architect, right? You know, if, if he's putting these plans together, he's going to want something where um, – his workers can, you know, drill straight on versus above their heads or like into the floor at an angle. It, it's got to be easy for them to use too. Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. That's why they always have people on stepping stools when they're putting in uh, screws above their head and things like that, or at a downward angle because uh, accuracy and positioning. I never even really thought about it that way. So. Everything we've talked about a lot so far. So how does everything we've talked about so far, you know, ergonomics, anthropomorphic. Anthropometry. Anthropometry relate You'll to biomechanics. Right. So so biomechanics, right? So thinking about that in the occupational sense, you're kind of using ergonomics and anthropometric data together to make this uh, – perfect unison in the way they use their equipment and the environment that they're in. Yeah, because now you're taking what you know. So you're taking the data and what you know about just general good practice and ergonomics, and you're applying it to how people would use it across usually like an eight-hour time span or however long a typical shift would be. Okay, so you're taking in the amount of use, also how heavily it'll be used in that amount of time, and you know, uh, certain factors like that, right? Yeah, you're looking at environmental constraints, what's going on with the body, how many people are there, all those ergonomic factors come together. How do they gather all that information? I mean, I mean, like, they gather all that information, but how do they, how do you take all that into consideration and match something up that works? So typically you're doing, like, a work system analysis, right? And, like, way back in the day, this used to just be filming somebody doing their job and kind of breaking down each piece-by-piece piece step. This is what a work system analysis is. Yeah, I mean, now it's a little more sophisticated, right? Uh, but, yeah, it's basically watching people do their jobs and trying to see where they're having issues or when they start to break down a little bit. Do you see issues in their workflow? Do they get tired? Right. Is it due to fatigue? Is it due to the certain task that they're doing at that point? Like, why what is preventing them from doing their job at that point? Okay, kind of like how they always look at uh, sports athletes in football, right? Explain. Well, like uh, like in football, they always have those people who they talked about like helmets, like messing people up for long-term times and how doctors look for those sort of things and how they've perfected like sports pads and where to place these sports pads based on common injuries that athletes get. Yeah, you're kind of like looking at data over time, for sure, and then helping you build better products as you go. Now you know how to ergonomics. So not only can you use this as data to design different types of products, but you can design how they use it, too. So how do you break down what the users do? So that kind of goes back to what we were talking about right. with the, uh, you know, breaking it down step by step, looking at, you know, where they break down. Uh, and then you can also use that NIOSH lifting equation that I mentioned earlier, right? And, uh, oh, man, did I not put it in the notes? No. no it's in the next uh, next section. Oh, it is oh, in the next section. You want to just jump in and talk about it? Let's go. Let's do yeah, it. All right, Let's sure. get this. So, so, uh, yeah, NIOSH. So, oh, man. That so, sounds really foreign. Right, right. Yeah, so so NIOSH. I, mm, 
I forgot what NIOSH stands for. <laughs> no. I thought it was some sort of name like, you know, Rasputin, you know, some 36th level human factors practitioner. Now entering the NIOSH's dungeon. Nyosh. He's going to be the next villain in my Pathfinder games. Okay. Nyosh. Cool. Uh, so basically what this is, is you're looking at the lifting limits um, within, you know, how, uh, within uh, sort of, a human capacity, right? Right. Um, and so, so these are these these equations are, or this equation is based off sort of what what is considered safe for the human to sort of lift, and it breaks it down by age, gender, um, you know, height, all these things. Uh, it also takes into account, um, you know, how how frequently you're lifting this thing, like. Are you lifting at five times an hour? Are you lifting at 20 times an hour? Uh, like I said, size of this thing. So, like, is it Death Star sized? Is it, you know, um, marble sized? Like, how, how big is this thing that you're lifting up? What's the environment like that you're working in? Is it slippery? Is it muddy? Well, so that's interesting because um, it doesn't take into account things like heat or cold. Uh, that's something that as a human factors or ergonomics practitioner, you have to keep into a, a consideration. Like, are they are they doing this under the hot summer sun? Are they are they like picking ice in the Arctic? These are things that you have to consider. But but it's not in the equation. But things like like slippery, mm-hmm. there there is a friction coefficient with like how your feet are on the floor, right? Like, right. Are, are you pushing something? Are you pulling something? How does friction play a role in that? Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and so, so it leads to a ton of different uh, interpretations of lifting limits, right? Because there's um, the uh, the definitions aren't operationally defined across, you know, all, all these all these things. Right, like, right, right. Like, like people work in the desert. People need uh, jack lifts, um, like um, the, the, what's those things called? Jack jack trucks. The jack the, trucks. The little trucks that forklift. Forklifts. Thank you. Forklifts. I can think of words. Um, they they use words fork- are hard. They use forklifts in the cold. They use it in the heat. They use it all these things, but they just make it tough enough to handle all those different types of conditions. Right, right, right. right. So, so yeah, because because there was not uh, an easy way to sort of wrap all these things together, they made this equation uh, to operationally define it. Okay. Okay. Right? So so they they made this work practices guide to manual lifting, and it's based on. Um, you know, musco- musculoskeletal. Things. Oh, I've seen this thing. This is that thing that says "Don't lift with your uh, back; lift with your legs." Right? It's on the poster of next to the OSHA thing. Kind of. It's it's directly related to. I, w- I was making sure. a joke. I mean, actually, but yeah, but that's but definitely yeah, important. I, I, oh, I, is it really? Sure. It really ah, is. Ha, 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 I'm a genius. Because like, think about it. It's, it's messing w- or it's trying to get you to use the proper mechanics too. Right, 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 right. What the ergonomic people design the thing to do, or be, it, or like at least designed it so that you can do this safely for X amount of reps, type of thing. I get it. I get it. Right, and so you take into account, um, so your muscular skeletal system, um, you know, your biomechanical limitations, uh, physiology. So like your heart rate, um, your cardiovascular system, how much oxygen are you taking in? How much ox- or CO2 are you producing? Um, uh, and psychophysical, so like uh, muscular strength um, and uh, lifting limits of a population, these kind of things. So it's based off all these things, right? And, and it creates this model that uh, sort of has a trade-off between how much the human could do uh, or, or you know, what kind of weight is recommended for the human, um, uh, uh, versus like, you know, what what they're actually doing or what they're being asked to do. All right. So they take in these different types of factors to help you with it, and this NIOSH guy, or this NIOSH system. It's not a person, right? Uh, yeah. No, NIOSH is it's not like a an person. organization. Right? It's an it organization. Is. Yeah, it is has decided how to actually make this work. So the ergonomics isn't only teaching us mechanically how to handle things better, but it's also teaching us how to actually use our bodies better. Yes. By appropriate lifting, yes. by things like that. Yes. Well, okay. When we talk about NIOSH, remember, it's kind of helping people design these different roles that they're going to hire for, right? So this helps them narrow down, like, how tall do I need somebody to be if they're lifting a lot of weight? Or if we're working in a smaller space, how how many people can I fit in here? Like sometimes it used, like especially back in the day, it used to help them 
uh, determine where, like, how big a space could be and how many people they could get in there. Well, that's interesting. So this is a lot of different aspects of our lives that we never even really think. Growing of. as much as human factors is. I mean, you know, there's there's an ever growing need to introduce the human to the system, and if it's a physical system, yeah, right. yeah, they need they need people to solve these problems and and uh, you, you know come up with these solutions. Like a, a colleague of mine uh, came up with, um, or or she did an analysis rather on. Uh, so so this company would get deliveries of these boxes and their their employees would unload them. And so she used the NIOSH lifting equation to sort of estimate uh, whether or not it was safe for them to do. And uh, it turns out it wasn't. So <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> really? That's interesting. I mean, by, by NIOSH recommendations, it was right, not. Right, right, um, right. And, and they were pushing it. And so, so I think she actually got like um, – uh, what do they call them? Like standard operating procedures passed to where they were able to use like uh, dollies and pushing carts uh, because this was unsafe for their workers. So, oh, that so, is so cool. That's kind of like you know liberating the worker and everything. Exactly. Yeah. So, so making their job easier by reducing the stress on their physical body um, through this equation. Okay. So the real question is: is like we talked about this a lot. And how do you apply these things? So real question is, what is a real world problem that can be solved by applying this? Like you just said, the the, the safety of a human worker and things like that. Blake looks eager to answer. Yeah, I mean, so this is <laughs> this is one that I like to get at because I have like a standing desk at work because I started to notice a lot of problems in my back and my like lower legs from sitting for like eight to 12 hours a day. There's a lot of standing desks at my work, too. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, that, they're adjustable. You can sit or stand. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, sit stand desk. The desks. things <laughs> sit stand desk. I mean, the thing that's interesting here is like uh, you have to take in all these things we've been talking about. So it's the ergonomic design. So now we're thinking about like how how straight you need to sit and where all your stuff is located. So if you're sitting or standing, making is, sure that all your like displays are all in the right place, where yeah. your hands and arms are. Is everything within reach? Um, are your are your wrists flat? Are you going to get carpal tunnel from using this? computer those kinds of things yeah so it it's kind of like the the interaction between standing and sitting so you have to make sure that you're like stable at all times uh keeping like your visual line straight and making sure that you've got like good posture and one thing that's kind of interesting is you actually when you're sitting you're consuming less energy so you're not as tired but it's good to switch between the two of them to try and like help blood circulation and circulation kind of uh musculoskeletal posture uh, yeah, there's a lot of benefits to standing and sit. We should do a whole episode on that. I feel you like you know I, that's really interesting because when I play video games, I stand. Do you? A lot of times, yeah. Unless it's like a solo experience where I can just like a long cutscene or a thing that is based on turns, then I sit. But like when I'm playing like Destiny with you, I'm standing you stand the whole time. Well, yeah, that's for the epic. most part. Oh no, I do because See, it, one, it's just angle, and two, it's um, I feel I find myself being able to. Uh, focus better when I'm actually standing. See, that's interesting because I only stand when I'm in something that is slightly above my skill level. So like if, if I'm going up against a boss or, or what are you trying to say? No, Nick? no, no. I'm, I'm saying <laughs> like if it's, if it's slightly above my skill level, you know, I, I, or like when I'm, when I'm super in the zone and I'm, I'm in my moment of flow, um, like I will get up and it helps me focus. Uh, whereas like if I'm just sitting back to play video games, I just sit down and relax. It's that's interesting. Yeah, no, but I mean, you think about it with you most of the time I'm doing harder content. So that's why I'm standing most of the time. That's really interesting because I find it work when I really am having a hard time focusing. If I stand, I can like bring it in a little more. I don't know if it's because I have to focus on my bodily posture or what it is, but I always think I'm doing more. Well, work. they always do tell you stand and deliver. There might be some more truth to that. To the See, psychology it's weird. Of it. It's weird when I'm, when I'm playing video games and I stand, I'm in the zone. But at work, I can't stand and work at the same time because I'm too distracted by, you know, trying trying to focus. Well, you're taking on... I wonder when you get the VR set because you'll have a 360-degree view around you or at least uh, 180 from what I've been hearing from most of the games coming out for the 360. PlayStation. Is it's, it 360? It's all 360. I mean, I'm wondering, are you going to are you going to be standing or sitting I'll be for sitting. That? You have to sit because it'll be dangerous otherwise. Oh, I thought it marked out like a space. Like it had a space for you to mark out. It did, but there's... That space is your sitting space. Like you don't want to stand when you're in virtual reality because 
what you're seeing is not trust me you do not want to stand unless you are able to move around in a physical environment that has zero obstacles otherwise it gets very dangerous and it's i mean i could go on with this forever because uh, so they designed this based on the idea of ergonomics yes they designed it in or i guess the the developers of these games designed it in the sense that they would expect you to sit oh okay okay right so there's this whole problem i mean Let's save this for the virtual, or let's save I this think for that's the PlayStation a great VR. concept. Yeah, yeah. Let's put that down there. So, um, so your biomechanics do affect you while you're sitting. We were talking about that. Like right. you were talking about that as well. Well, that's really an interesting thing. Is that problem? But you know, having those options, I guess that's why those sit stand desks are getting so popular nowadays. Yes, yeah, right. to make you try and like focus on your posture at all times, or like keeping keeping yourself from getting that hunchback of Notre Dame look by focusing on your spine right. alignment. Like, right, right. I mean, right. there's there's other things that go into this too. Like, I mean, you get more stability when you're sitting rather than standing because you're anchored. Your your center of gravity is lower. Um, you're not using as much energy when you're sitting because right. you don't have to tighten all your muscles to sort of stabilize yourself. Um, you know, y- there's there's less uh, strain on uh your legs i would imagine it also helps with blood flow standing helps a little bit more with blood flow than right. than sitting but alternating between the two helps more than one or the other that is so interesting it's all about movement yeah. it is ah, maybe that's yeah. also why a lot of video game players have started actually going on the treadmill when they play computer games yeah i i want an omnidirectional treadmill yes. uh, <laughs> that'd yeah, be awesome. those things are cool anyway he's not gonna be happy until mm-hmm. he becomes the lawnmower man people I won't. I won't. All right. So a whole episode on sit-standing desks. I think think so. I think that's a great idea. I'm kind of excited about that idea. Sweet. All right, guys. Let's Uh, all stand when we do that episode and see if there's any difference. Oh, man. I I don't know if I'd be able to focus. Stand and deliver. Uh, Well, you're going to have to. That will be the the idea. Well, you know what, guys? I hate to say it, but I think that's going to be it for today. All right. Uh, If you guys want to be featured on our show... We're all over the social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, 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 Facebook. or Twitter, or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all of your questions. You can also get to the front of the line, uh, the question line, uh, by supporting us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We're all over the place. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics that our listeners want to hear about on the show, so feel free to suggest a way. I want to thank Blake Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show as a guest for the last time. Welcome next week. Blake, where can our listeners find you? As always, you can find me on the Twitters at UXChillBro. And uh, Billy, where can they find you? As always, you can always find me on YouTube. Always. Yes, at uh, Comstar Cleric, streaming all your games. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on Twitter at Nick Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It It depends. depends. It depends. Dependable.